Hello and welcome to The Print. Uh, today we're joined by Ashika Dutt. Thank you for joining us, Ashika. Um, she's an accomplished uh, Dalit writer who's best known for her 2019 memoir coming out as a Dalit. The book chronicles her journey uh, reclaiming her public identity, her identity in the public eye. Um, so when audiences uh, watched the hugely successful uh, second season of the Amazon web series Made in Heaven, um, many saw striking similarities between her and a character in one of the episodes played by Radhika Apte. Um, this episode is the hard skip to beat directed by uh, Neeraj Kewan and it sort of centers around um, a Dalit Buddhist wedding. Um, the character storyline is fictional, but parts of it are rooted in reality. Yashika's reality. Um, so just to start things off, Yashika, how are you and how have the last, can you sort of summarize what's been going on for the last month or so? Yeah, Vandana, thank you so much for giving me this platform to speak about things. Um, I think it's no secret at this point that the last five weeks or so have been incredibly difficult. I think some might use the word traumatizing to describe uh, the events the way that have unfolded. Um, I, I've been better, I think is all I can say. I am very lucky and extremely fortunate that I have a very strong support system around me. Um, I've got really good friends in the city. I've got loved ones and um, people, you know, my family back home and friends back home. I'm connected to a lot of folks who genuinely care about me and genuinely care about how I'm experiencing this, um, these string of attacks, this coordinated hate campaign that I've had to face relentlessly and pretty much all on my own. Um, folks have like, you know, I read your piece and congratulations for writing such a terrific piece. I I think as a journalist, like I was saying, it's very hard to achieve that balance. And I I, I think it's to you speaks to your credibility that you were able to do that. Um, I think in the past couple of weeks I've had you know, really low lows, I think is the way we, I, I might like to put it. And, um, you know, mental health is a huge conversation in our communities in within the larger Dalit community. And that conversation started more specifically around the time of Rohit Bemula's death, the institutional murder that he had to undergo and experience. And he was forced to take his life, right? And when that happened, we talked about what pushes a human being to do the extremely difficult thing of taking their own life, because it's certainly a very challenging thing to do. Every every part of fiber of your being wants to survive, but you have to override that and take this horrific step to to harm yourself, to end your life. And that speaks to the castest pressures uh, that we face as Dalit individuals in society, how much we have to advocate for ourselves. And this is in no way comparing the situation because I know every word of mine is being carefully watched right now, but I'm making a point about how stressful it is to exist as a lower caste person in the society, whether you're in India or in the United States, just your identity as a lower caste human being, as a lower caste woman in particular, comes with a lot of um, with a lot of burden, you know, I think I was reading the Mook Nayak earlier this morning and they said Dalit women live, live 14 years less on an average than Savarna women. And that's an extremely telling statistic. It talks about how our bodies are affected by constantly having to battle caste. And I have faced this firsthand um, in the past five weeks where my identity was called into question repeatedly, where I was attacked for no reason other than the fact that I was a Dalit woman. There is nothing that I have done or said that is so egregious that merited this coordinated hate campaign against me. And I want to say that th this had very little to do with anything that I've said and done, but everything to do with what I represent right now. A Dalit woman who does not fit in the mold of um, what she's expected to be, who does does exactly what she thinks and feels is right, who takes stances like my support for Dalit Muslim and Christian reservation very openly in July, 
these this is not a popular stance to take, but I feel that this is the right one. And I have done that. And this backlash that I've faced that is so vicious, that is coming from many of the same handles who attacked me back then as well. So, you know, there is a history to this narrative as well. And to see myself being targeted in this brutal and cruel and vicious way from allegedly people from my own community, you know, and and I don't know what that means anymore, was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And it also made me realize, you know, when I was growing up, my mom would say that, don't forget that we are bhangi, you know, no matter what, people will look at us like that, even within the Dalit community, as we've seen, right? There are fractures within, um, on the basis of what caste and what region you belong to, what affiliations you have. The solidarity is not, um, the solidarity is not a given, which I somehow assumed it would be. I mean, because I've extended my solidarity to Dalit people um, in the past, and I still will. It's not going to change how I feel, but it was really heartbreaking to realize that um, I really didn't have a community, so to speak. The community was created in response to my hate, but the people I assumed I would rely on or I would be able to call in were really not the folks who had my back, but instead were attacking me in the most in the most unprecedented and shocking way that I've never seen a Dalit woman being treated like this um, online or, you know, at least in the, in my experience. So yeah, it's been, it's been dreadful. I, I think that's, that's fair to say. I'm sorry to hear that. It sounds like I can't even imagine um, what it must've been like for you, but just to recap, uh, you watched the episode and then you posted a statement um, asking uh, the creators of Made in Heaven to credit you um, for the work. And they responded sort of denying that that, that they'd read your book and had been inspired by it, but there were no similarities between you and the character on the screen. And that sort of uh, triggered a sort of a chain reaction um, that happened online when, um, you know, your your usage of the term coming out as a target was sort of brought under the focus. And, um, you know, we had... a uh, other people linked him um, or saying that or saying that you know credit should be split or um, it sort of triggered a very a different kind of conversation um, what was the most I know you touched on this just now but what was the most distressing thing for you um, while this entire um, situation unfolded I think the obvious thing for me, and I'll come to the distress in a minute, the obvious thing to me was that this demand that I made from Made in Heaven was used as a device to settle all past scores that folks had with me. And I think what this incident has done is thrown out in the open the resentment. And I think it's fair to say at this point, there is a great deal of resentment around my visibility within the so-called anti-caste community that has come wide, that, that has become wide open. And this this claim over coming out as Dalit is you know, for me, as far as I see it, it's a classic twisting of the narratives. I mean, if anybody has been following this from the beginning in 2016, I wrote the words in my Facebook post, today I'm coming out as Dalit. I talked about it pretty much on my own for a very long time. You know, between the years 2016 and 2019, when my book came out, I talked uh, about coming out as Dalit a lot in articles, in Uh, you know, pieces in my social media posts, I never fail to not make a mention. And guess what the reaction to me saying that was? A lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of pushback from within the anti-caste community for saying the words coming out as Dalit. I got pushback and still, you know, look at the, look at some of the handles who are still attacking me for hiding my identity. I've been always attacked for daring to hide my identity and daring to survive. I've been attacked for using the words Dalit. So many people from the community said that the word Dalit should not be used and it's it's not representative of who we are. And uh, people have said, what, what are even these words coming out as Dalit? That is before the book came out. Nobody, I did not 
and it's sad to say I would have not admitted this on a public platform before this incident, but I think I have to say it was pretty sad that I didn't receive a lot of support from even within the vocal Dalit community for my work. Now, of course, I was embraced by international Dalit communities. I've extensively talked about Ambedkar International Center, and they, you know, really appreciated who I was and what I stood for. But on social media, this term was always very contested. Mm -hmm. And then my book came out. And if you look at my interviews with The Wire, with you guys, I'm constantly having to defend these words. I'm constantly having to explain what does coming out as Dalit mean and why I'm using it and how it is a term that has existed in the LGBTQ community for a century and why I'm using that framework to explain um, on the framework of caste. Then my book won the Sahitya Academy Award in 2021. Before that, it I was at the Jaipur Lit Fest. You know, Jaipur Lit Fest is, doesn't, I'm not sure whether, you know, we're in the same state where we consider it to mean something in the very same way that it did back in 2020. Things are different now. But back then, it was a really big deal. And I was attacked for promoting my book using the deaths of Rohit Vamila, which is an experience that really impacted me personally. So I talked about it. And I think people should talk about how he had to die for this movement to come about. And like you mentioned in your piece, this is not new for me, this hate or this pushback. I've just, as long as I've been in the public eye, and that's a long time, seven, eight years. I'm not, I'm just a writer. I'm just a journalist doing my job. And I've received this hate and pushback from the very same people. I mean, some of the handles who were attacking me, I blocked them three years ago. I didn't block them today. And they continue to come after me. So this debate about who owns coming out as Dalit, why does it happen now? Why did it not take place when I needed somebody to stand up and say, hey, there is already a precedent for this? Mm -hmm. Why was it not used in my defense? Am I not allowed to ask that? Am I not allowed to say, where were you for all these years when I've been facing relentless hate for just saying these words? And now that they have taken off, thanks to my work, and I don't think anybody can deny because clearly we didn't hear about this public owning of this term until now, right? So until now, my work has carried forward this term. Neeraj Gavin in his Instagram post acknowledged my work with this term. He didn't acknowledge the other Dalit academic because it's all in all fairness and possibility, it's likely that he didn't know. Because after he posted that post on Instagram, it started making rounds on Twitter that, oh, you know, there is an academic who wrote this blog in 2007. But if you look at it, within the anti-caste community, there is Rajesh Rajamani who wrote in News Laundry, Swati Kamble who wrote for The Wire, Sunit Samos who wrote for The Quint. These are all Dalit uh, anti-caste people, they're intellectuals and, they've and academics. And they've talked about how the anti-caste community no, most people did not know about this term or this blog with the origin of the Dalit academic. The academic was on a panel with me in April at Columbia. I never heard him say this once. He has known of my work for a very long time because the U.S. Dalit academic and intellectual community is very small. So, you know, we've been, I was, you know, if you look at past tweets, we've been tagged in the same tweets from many, many years ago. Why did we not hear about this until now? Isn't the timing suspicious? And also, to, so to use words like plagiarism and flagrantly come after somebody, have the, you know, many, I saw some publications who chose to sort of just reproduce his words as is. Did someone make the effort to check whether this claim has any validity? What is coming out? Coming out is a century old term, like I said, that exists within the LGBTQ community, but it's not even from them. It came from the debutante balls, the socialite balls that happened in the United States in the 18th century. Gay men took that term of coming out as their introduction to the homosexual society in the pre-World War era. That is the history of that term. It's been around for decades and decades now. During the AIDS crisis, People talked about coming out as gay, coming out as queer. Now we talk about, you know, in the past 10, 12 years, coming out as trans, coming out as pansexual. These are new identities. They're all in the ether. If somebody, to, you know, I, I was looking um, online, there are like 
15 books that use the word coming out in the title. Should they all be crediting one academic who wrote a blog in 2007? Some of these books are from early 2000s. Some of these books are from the 80s. Like nobody can claim. And I think that's the whole point of them making this into an issue because this is clearly orchestrated, you know, that let's make her say that nobody can own the term coming out so we can cover our behinds in court. It's very clear. I mean, anybody who has any understanding of this can say that they are attacking me on this term only so that they're not held liable in court. That is why this whole confusion, this hate campaign has been created without even thinking that there's a Dalit woman with her work that has been conducted in the public eye at the center of it all. This was done very ruthlessly. And by them, you mean um, the producers of Made in Heaven? Mm -hmm. Right. And just to add... I mean, the characters of Made in Heaven, because to Neeraj Kevin's credit, he acknowledged it in his Instagram post. Yeah. So... I think it's the Savarna makers, the three uh, women who have written and produced this show, who are responsible for this hate campaign in a very direct way. And just to add context, uh, the academic that you were talking about is Dr. Samit Bhad, who wrote um, a paper um, using the term coming out in the context. Um, they were sort of on the intersections of gender, sexuality and caste. I just so. But um, is this. Is this a battle for credit or is the fight about something larger? What do you This is not a battle just for credit. This is a battle for the erasure of Dalit labor. It has never been just a fight about me. You know, I what am I getting out of this? Five weeks of hatred that have completely um ruined my mental health. Mm -hmm. I'm not really I I already have a book deal in the United States. Mm -hmm. I have a two book deal. I don't even have to generate press or promotion that has been said, you know. Right. I don't need a, a new publisher for the next six, seven years. Right. They I'm contractually in, you know, with them to write two books. Mm -hmm. The reason I think it was important for me to raise my voice is because now we are seeing a new standard within Bollywood in particular. Take Dalit stories and yeah. leave Dalit people behind. Take Adivasi stories, leave them behind. You know, this happened with the elephant whisperers, yeah. women and belly. Yeah. Right? They did not have the same kind of visibility of oh, okay. yeah, yeah. or boys, you know, to talk about this and advocate for themselves in the same way. I yeah. covered the story for Khabar Aheria when yeah. Writing with Fire was released. And you might, I don't know if you've read the caravan piece, it really clearly talks about how Dalit individuals and their stories are becoming this uh, selling point. And in fact, within the community, some of these anti-caste handles themselves might say and have talked about how, you know, these Savarna academics, Savarna directors often take our stories and forget the people behind. There's been enough research on Dalits since the beginning of the century. That's not new. What is new is Dalit people telling our own stories. Right. And that's what Gavin has, which is right. like, I will always defend this, the episode. I will always defend um, what it means to the community, but I will also not allow Bollywood to take my likeness from me to take my story that I created and fought for and that I've received, you know, frankly, very little in return for in terms of visibility, yes. But, you know, I'm still a freelancer living pretty much on my own without a full-time gig or anything like that. So, you know, um, these people cannot just take a narrative that I created. And frankly, you know, there is an issue with a Dalit woman standing up and saying, I did this. People are not used to seeing somebody who said, hey, that's my work. Please credit me. And that's a huge issue because Dalit people, Dalit women, and I'm a Bhangi person. I think I want it to be very, very clear. I'm not just, you know, garden variety Dalit, whatever that means. I'm from the lowest of the low castes. Even within our communities, as Ambedkar says, there's a descending order of contempt. So that discrimination exists within our communities. The the content for the Bhangi community exists within the larger Dalit community as well. And to see a Bhangi woman who everybody considers lower than her to stand up without shame and say, that's my work. 
that people can't tolerate. A lot of people don't want to hear that. And that's what this is about as well. Because I'm not ashamed to say, I created the story, where's my credit? But also beyond that, it's about, you know, when when this whole thing was happening, I got so many messages from Dalit people, Dalit women across the country who reached out to me on Instagram. This is not happening on Twitter. So, you know, people can't say, where was this? They directly reached out to me and they said, you're really inspiring us to fight for ourselves. You're showing us what it means and what it takes to stand up for what is right and to not give in to the shame that these people are forcing you to feel. And you are really changing how people, especially if you're a Dalit woman, how can you stand up for what you believe in? And that means everything for me. But also it's about you know, more than credit, it's about my whole career, right? Like I just started out seven, eight years ago. Hopefully I'll be writing for a very long time. If I set this precedent now that someone from Bollywood can take my story and run with it, who knows how many times will they do that in the future? I have to stand up for myself now and I have to stand up for myself, for me who is from the future and for so many other Dalit writers, we will only get more powerful. Our stories will only get more visible. They will only become more profitable. Mm -hmm. We need to credit people who create these stories, not just take what's, you know, glossy and glamorous and a good narrative and then reject the people who put their life behind it to create it. Right. And the episode itself, um, directed by Neeraj, is um, really nuanced, uh, it actually very it's it's it shows an empowered um dalit woman um and is is a departure from the kinds of portrayals that we're used to seeing um, of caste on screen um and like you were just saying the dalit community is not a monolith so one like a one a particular story while the experience of coming out publicly as a dalit might be universal one story can't really um it's not possible to tell the story of the entire community and, and i want to kind of go back to what you just said that your particular identity um as a Bang, as a Bangi woman um changes the narrative because that's not um the kind of story that everybody in the community um can say that ha has happened um but when when you look back on this ordeal in 10 years how would you like to remember it what what is what what, what is it that you would like to yeah hope to come from it wow you know Manana, that's such a heavy question because i'm still experiencing it like it's not behind me some of the people that you've quoted in the story have continued to attack me you know um as much as far as like as recently as yesterday so um, it's hard for me to say how will I look back on this because, you know, um, hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say. But I think what I'm already realizing is that this experience for me has crystallized my belief in why I do the work that I do. It really has. And, you know, it would be obvious to somebody to think, is she still going to continue to put herself out there? But for me, it makes me feel like what I've been saying has been right. They have the, the detractors, the people who came after me with this coordinated hate campaign, proved me right that no matter what your visibility is, you can be in the United States, you can be a national award winning writer, you can have a book deal uh, with a really prestigious publisher in Boston. But at the same time, you will still be derided and denigrated and you will be humiliated or at least attempted to be by people who don't think of you as a person that who is equal to them. There is a lot of misogyny in this response. And the word misogyny has been thrown around a lot. And people are saying, oh, you know, I'm a queer, so I can't be misogynist. I'm a woman, so I can't be misogynist. I think what's what we need to understand when we talk about misogyny is that it's an ideology. It's a way of thinking where we feel that Dalit women don't have the right to express themselves in the same way that Dalit men do where we feel that Dalit women should always echo the ideas that Dalit men have put forward, that they should be auxiliaries, that they should be one step behind. Or if they are faces, they should be the kind of faces that have been dictated and picked by Dalit men, 
not people who came up on their own. And I think that's very important and telling in terms of, you know, the universality of ex- of this experience and the specificity of what I'm saying. You know, unfortunately, the Bhangi community, the Safai Karamchari community, the Valmiki community in the North is substantial in numbers, but it has very little political representation. You know, if you look at it within the larger so-called movement, um, Safai Karamchari Andolan, is its own separate movement. And one has to wonder why that exists separately, right? Why do we not have many Bhangi intellectuals outside of Bhagwan Das? Bhagwan Das was um, a pioneering Bhangi intellectual who wrote this book called Mai Bhangi Hu, and which says, which means in English, I'm Bhangi. And he worked with Ambedkar. And this book was recently published by Navrayana, I think in 2010, or please fact check on this. And he had to write this book, not saying my Dalit hum, but my Bhangi hum, that I'm not Dalit, I'm Bhangi, because that's a very specific and, se- and separate identity. It shows the ignorance of the Savarna makers that they said, oh, you know, it's something that came up in our research, cleaning toilets. It didn't come up in your research. It's my life story. I went on stages. I went on Fade Souza's interview and talked about how my grandmother used to clean bathrooms. And I use that word. You can go ahead and people are online. Look at that interview. I say these exact words. Do they understand what it took me to be able to say these words without shame? The, the identity of my caste is a slur. You know, I, I was speaking to a lot of friends who know me from school. They told me that people would often call me sweeper behind my back. They would say, oh, you know, she might be good in studies, but ultimately she's a sweeper. Sweeper jati se, sweeper caste se. That is how people would talk about me. I've I've had traumatizing experiences of living with upper caste women who have constantly attacked and berated me for being dirty when I was no less clean or dirty compared to them. You know, I've been I've been targeted in a, in a number of ways just for specifically being bhangi. Even though I thought that I wasn't talking about this or I wasn't, you know, I wasn't telling anybody my identity. Can you really hide caste in a country like India? Absolutely not. You can pretend maybe here and there in a couple of instances, but people always find out. I've had this experience of lowerness my entire life. And if there's anything that this experience, like you asked me, what will I look at it 10 years from now? I will look at it as an experience that taught me how caste never goes away. And like, I really, you know, a quote from your article says, if they can do this to Yashika Dutt, imagine what they would do to other Dalit authors who don't write in English. And that's absolutely accurate because I have, and that's not because I'm somebody like big or any, or I think too highly of myself. It's because I have a voice and I'm in the United States. I live in New York. I have recognition here. You know, my text has been used in the Seattle law. It's part of United States law, like my article from the New York Times was quoted directly in the law for Seattle, the the city of Seattle, with the anti-discrimination ban that they instituted in February. So I have visibility. But if this is how I can be treated, then there is, you know, there is really no telling about how a Dalit person with not the same visibility and voice can be stolen from. Just for context, that quote is by from S. Anand, who runs Navayana, the anti-caste publishing house um, that you were just talking about. Uh, to leave this on a more forward-looking note, um, what what's next for you? Um, and and how? Yeah, what's next for you? I have to really think about that answer because what's next is to have a day where I don't feel like I'm being attacked. And what's next for me is to hope that I can spend a whole week without having to wake up in the middle of night and check Twitter and see what's the new thing that has been said about me. And what's next is having a whole month where I can just focus on my work and not be dragged for just being myself, not be dragged for just being a Dalit person, um, a Dalit woman, somebody, you know, who is representing a reality for uh, hundreds of thousands of people in this country and you know a couple of weeks where I can I'm not being slandered by people where I'm not being brutally mocked where you know there are not being false heads spread about my family where my mother is not being raised or brought into question you know the good thing is the reality of the anti anti-caste community has really come to the fore 
And for people who have supported me, I'm incredibly thankful to them. For 60 plus names, including Mr. Chandrasekhar Azad Ravan, Mr. Prakash Ambedkar, Abina Palakal, uh, Chand- Chandrabhan Prasad, mm-hmm. all these people have gone out of their way to support me. Jeet Thayil, mm-hmm. Arjuna Parai. These are people who have put the weight of their names behind me. And it means a lot. Like, and, and not just people who have recognition, but like so many people who are just students who have re- who have put their names on the petitions and who've been reaching out to me by dozens. I receive dozens of Instagram messages every day where people are saying, Yashika, I'm a Dalit woman too. I'm so sorry this is happening. Don't let them win. And, you know, things like of that nature. And, and uh, my hope is that looking forward, you know, my book is coming out in February in, in the, in the United States. And, I want to sort of be ready to do that in a, in a in a complete way. You know, I want to be able to talk about my book. I want to be able to focus on the anti-caste movement that is in the U.S. right now. You know, California is on the verge of becoming the first state in the country mm. to ban caste. It's a huge deal. I want to get back to being more involved with that in whatever way. You know, I'm not... I know people think of my work in the realm of activism, but I think of myself as a journalist, as a storyteller of the movement. You know, we are important. We might not be necessarily uh, be on the ground in the same way folks are, but we tell the stories. We're the bookkeepers of this movement. And I consider myself one of those, you know, going back to more stories around that movement, you know, and uh, just focusing on the positives and, and, thinking more about the support that I've received from, you know, hundreds of people. And my Instagram post, the original one has 30,000 likes. That's not to say that, oh, look at how many likes I have, but because that shows the support that I've received from people. You know, Neeraj Kevin's Instagram post where he posted his statement was filled with comments from people saying, do the right thing and give Yashika the credit. They turned that into saying she's bullying Kevin. I didn't even know those people. Their reaction you know, like I've written, you've written the story, their reaction caused this avalanche of, uh, you know, accountability. My response to them and demand from them was a simple request. It was a calling in. And my hope is that in the coming few days, I can recover because it's been a drain on my mental health, seeing these comments and reading them over and over again. I I don't have like a DM coordinated uh, effort, you know, clearly that's what's going on on Twitter. I don't have a social media manager. I'm the one who's reading each and every comment that is written about me. Often when I've blocked them, of course not, but you know, I'm the one who's facing the heat and the humiliation. And, uh, my hope is to just come out of this unscathed in a way that my mental health is intact and I hope to not be depressed or anxious in the next coming weeks. So yeah, that's what's next. I hope that, I mean, thank you for sharing your story with us, Yashika, and taking the time and I wish you um, rest and recovery. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us and thank you uh, for watching.